lived experience in the reentry system. And thinking about the horrific, traumatic experience that I had and trying to reenter society to rebuild my life it really mirrored the prison system. CROP is important and historic as an organization because we're an organization of five, six now with Tara, um, former lifers who the state of California has entrusted $28.5 million to build out a state-of-the-art innovative reentry program. One of the most important things for us to understand as a society is the importance of proximity and why it's important to allow the voices of people with lived experience. But more important than allowing the voices is allowing the leadership and supporting that leadership. When people who have lived through it, oftentimes they have the best solutions to what those particular problems are came home and, and we imagined this model for a reentry system which was informed upon by our experiences, our lived experiences of what it was like to live inside a prison and what it was like to come home and face some of the challenges out here. Uh, there were a lot of people who said it's not going to happen. You're not going to get that type of level of support from the state. Um, it's just not possible. We continued to press forward and uh, convince legislatures that this was the, uh, uh, the right choice when it comes to preparing people to successfully re-enter into society, uh, to invest in their success versus investing in their punishment. Got contracts with Google and Oracle and Microsoft and went to UC Berkeley and got them to sign on board and then went to the legislature. There's 600,000 people that get out of prison a year. Most of those people are unskilled. Most of those people don't have support systems and most of those people can't access livable wage. So we think there needs to be an inter intermediary system built where people have access to safe housing, which is this crop campus. They have access to getting all the skills that they need to survive. They can reset and then prepare to thrive. Yeah, I got involved with crop um, because my son was um, involved. They got involved with my son his sophomore year in high school. And they told me and my family that, you know, don't worry about your son. It's 300 plus men in here and he's standing on our shoulders, you know? I thought that was like the most, I've never heard of that before. And I've been around a lot of people, right? But, um, you know, you could probably do that with a dozen people or whatever, but to look around a room and see 300 men and know that they say, man, we got your son. It's powerful. Powerful, you know? Powerful. So, for me, that, that was my most, touch a moment you know you can't put a money amount on it or articulate it in words you know it's, it's priceless man and for that I'm forever debtful to them that's what it's about you know giving back because they gave to me they gave to me so how I got involved with crop is I'm a mother of a son who's incarcerated um, he literally went from a high school classroom to a prison cell so you know for me, my biggest fear was when he comes home because he never had a driver's license. He doesn't know how to drive. You know, he, he has never really worked other than in the prison system. So I'm like, how is he gonna, how is it gonna work? You know, what's the parole board look like or, or the parole or, you know, you know, he's been convicted. He's got the label. And so all of these things, you know, kept me up at night. No person that I met in prison was was not redeemable. This has been over 20 years in my career. I've been seeing anyone not blossom when given an opportunity. Understand that a lot of trauma for people happened far before they went to prison. The best salve, or the most effective salve in my own healing from incarceration has been the tremendous community I've been a part of here in the Bay Area who has treated me like one of their own and restored my sense of humanity. Helping them to, you know, kind of unpack the prison experience, unpack what it's like to live in a way that's very much how animals live, in a cage, right? Being treated, treated as if you are a second-class citizen, someone who's not worthy of anything good. So to, to, to like, remove the lid of possibilities, you know, one of the, the most, um, valued and useful tools in personal transformation as well as cultural transformation is community support. Um, we believe that it's you know, 
nearly impossible, um, very hard and unlikely for someone to fail when they have 10 people around them um, supporting them in their success. So in respects to the Ready for Life program and CROP as an organization, this is at the center of our mission and our values, is really investing in people over punishment. Even the thought of punishment isn't a deterrent to stopping individuals from committing crime. If they're in a need, right, and they are believing and truly thinking that committing a crime is for essentially the best decision they're making in that moment, we need to make sure that they have many more choices outside of an option of criminal thinking or criminal behavior. And we do that by providing them first with housing and then a clear pathway into improving their employment opportunities. So it's important that everybody understands that the number one driver of mass incarceration is poverty. People who um, made poor choices are, are often treated as if they need to be punished continually, whether it be living, condi living conditions, whether it be opportunities um, for advancement or growth or um, or rehabilitation for that matter. I think it's I think it's very instructive that to keep someone in prison it's over $100,000 a year um, out of a taxpayer's pockets but only 2% of that actually goes towards rehabilitation. A third of the workforce has some form of arrest record so if we continue this notion of making people carry a scarlet letter around the rest of their lives rather than saying hey we recognize you made a mistake you paid your debt to society you paid your debt to the state now we're going to support you in rebuilding your life and becoming a contributing member to society. I'm not for sure what we're doing as a civilized society if we're not providing that opportunity. And we really want to secure employment that's sustainable for people reentering society. We don't want them out there earning minimum wage, struggling. Why we chose the technology-based economy to provide people access to. The future of work in, in every study is, is knowledge-based. And when you take people from prison and you tell them that the only thing that they can do is pick up a wheelbarrow or put on an orange vest to pick up stuff on the side of the freeway, that A, that doesn't provide livable wage, but it also doesn't say very much about the human being. When you invest in people's mental capacity and their intellectual capacity and you provide them opportunity, you really see a shift in transformation and value in the way people feel about themselves. It, without forgiveness, we're all in prison. And so that's really important as, as even as victims to remember that, um, you know, forgiveness is a, is a process and it's a journey and it's certainly not easy, um, but it's integral to our freedom collectively. We don't necessarily advocate for our program um, making contact with the victims of crime, but we feel like that if, if our population is taking something, from the taking something from a community by committing a crime, that it's our obligation, our responsibility to give back to the community. And so in one way, we want to help ourselves to be successful and to reintegrate back into the community, but we also want to give back to the community that we harmed. And so that's the kind of brand of restorative justice that we practice here at CROP. I also love that the CROP team has a bigger vision for changing you know, societies and living in restorative and transformed communities. It's not just about the justice system, it's, it's actually even bigger. And so that's personally my biggest excitement, but you have to do that um, you know, on micro levels before you can hit a macro level. Everything needs to be all encompassing, it needs to be a one-stop shop, it needs to be able to allow people to feel like they are fully and totally investing in themselves, because that's why we're investing in them. Well, what CROP is doing differently today is they're answering the phone. They're answering your email. They're answering your text. Not every organization, unfortunately, does that. Nobody gets back to you. And when they do get back to you, it's a month, three months. Oh, what was it that you needed? What information? Oh, sorry. This is an organization that gets back to you. And that means a lot to a mother who has a son incarcerated. We have so much work to do. We cannot delay it any further, and yet, we want to make sure we're doing it right. We want to have every aspect considered of how would this look in practice, how will this be received by a participant and an associate that's going through the program, how will this uplift our work, and how will it influence other systems and service providers, not only on a state level, but a national level. So our actions today 
is going to start the ripple effect for 10 years to come.